My name is Kyle. I am an internal Jamf employee. I work for our information security team building tools, automations, and things that might not necessarily really exist publicly. Uh, you might have seen me before in a couple of other ones. Uh, I've built our Splunk add-on, our Power BI add-on, Domo, and a few others. Today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, macOS application security, uh, intelligence, and vulnerability detection, uh, some of the things that we're able to do internally, um, some of the workflows that we have built to help us enable our users to download the applications that make them work best, while also maintaining our compliance uh, posture. And with that, let's jump in. So I have to begin this uh, agenda with uh, the start, the, the house cleaning. We have some definitions about legal, what we do, what we offer. I'm going to go into a little bit about like what job Jamf offers today, and then I'm going to talk about CVEs and industry reports in some of those spaces. So I was asked by legal, this has to be read verbatim. Some of what I will show you is not a product we offer today, but a workflow we use internally to manage our risk with applications that users install on their end machines. If you like this workflow, reach out to your customer success team and talk about your story. All right, so the problem statement. Uh, how many of us in this room have had a Friday night where a major software vendor releases a vulnerability statement and the industry is basically screaming patch now? It's on Stack Overflow, it's uh, Mac Admins, it's just screaming, you know, patch Chrome, patch Firefox, Adobe has a problem. In the Apple space, like, how do you get to a point that you can detect it? How can you report on it? And then how can you resolve that without having to wake up the entire IT organization or the entire organization, like the security and IT and um, biz ops and compliance? Like, how do you resolve these passively so it's just not an issue to your end users? And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about in this case. So when we talk about vulnerabilities, there's kind of three different ways that you're able to detect them. And we start with like probably the best method, the, the gold standard, which is runtime on the machine. And this would be our protect agent or EDR agents in general. Uh, as an application starts up, the EDR solution constantly is pulling it and finding out what's going on. Where is it reaching out to? Uh, does it match any like known hashes for files? Uh, this usually is for like uh, spyware detection or malware detection or viruses, you know, that kind of like really heavy intrusive. And we offer that through our protect agent. The next is you can detect a lot of these through data in flight. And this is what our safe internet solution is about detecting. I can find out, are you talking, is your device in communication with a nefarious solution out there? For instance, uh, are you talking with, uh, say, a government entity that is, that you're not allowed to talk to? Are you talking to a botnet? Uh, are your NESCO is supposed to be going? Do you have, is your data being protected uh, along the way? And then the other one, and then this is what this presentation is actually about, is like an inventory slash passive type of detection. Um, there's a lot of benefits to the inventory detection that you can't get on a runtime based, but there's a huge number of caveats. Uh, basically, like applications have to be consistently uh, run for a lot of times the runtime agents to be able to detect them. And this just covers up a little bit of that. So specifically what we're after is what's well, called common vulnerabilities and exposures. Uh, common vulnerabilities and exposures are uh, statements from software vendors that there is some kind of uh, issue or vulnerability or excessive rights to data that is not intended in the application. These are typically reported by American uh, software companies because uh, a lot of them have legal obligations to report them. And the main database that you get these is called NVD. It's run by NIST and MITRE. And then there's a subset of these that's run by CISA where they enrich the NVD. And there's other companies as well that take the NVD and they add their, their own metadata around it. There's like, uh, hey, is this out in the wild? What kind of risk is there? Uh, many of these can be recon detected, like I mentioned earlier. Um, they exist based off of just the, you know, the version statements, which we're going to crack one on the next slide. But uh, the thing is, most of these tend to be related to compliance metrics. So a lot of contracts say, hey, if it's in the NVD and it's a critical, after you detect it, you should resolve it in 14 days or 21 days or whatever it is. Um, you get some adjustments related to that to the compliance frameworks you're, you're working in or CSA might say, this CVE needs to be resolved by this date and you need to verify that. So let's take a look and crack one. So this might be a little bit hard to read. Um, this is one for Adobe. I grabbed an easy one uh, for us to look at. This is what a configuration and a CVE looks like. 
Uh, in here, the very first part you have is the vendor, the product, and the version limits. So the vendor is Adobe. The product that Adobe is claiming has this uh, vulnerability is Media Encoder. And then you have a slew of uh, version limits. So in this case, we're looking at version end excluding. So 15.4.1 resolves whatever the issue is with this. If you want to find out what this is, there's a description that would be above this, but you know, I only have so much space on the slide for, to put this. After this, you have operating system. So I can tell you from this uh, CVE statement that Adobe has a product called Media Encoder, and it can be run on Microsoft Windows, it can be run on Apple Mo Mac OS, uh, but it doesn't say like iPhone OS, or it doesn't say like iPad OS or Watch OS. So, um, but the, traditionally, the, the, the questions that we're trying to resolve here is, well, first, can this CVE be represented on an Apple device? CVEs release at a scale of 30 to 50,000 per year. And of those, you know, only about 1,000, 2,000, maybe 3,000 can actually be represented accurately on a Mac OS device. After you say, yes, you know, this CVE explicitly says this can be on Mac OS. We have to ask the question of, can you detect this on recon? Or are you going to require a script to do it? If it's detectable off of recon, uh, it's typically going to be in your applications table. Uh, so how is this represented in the application? Which is, well, what's the darn app? What's the darn app? In this case, the answer is it's uh, Adobe Media Encoder 2021. The bundle ID is the com.adobe.ame.application.15. Uh, so <laughs> say that off the tongue 15 times real fast. And the latest version, as according to our Kenobi and the time I recorded this, which was uh, sometime in July, was 15.4.5. So from the CV, I can tell you that, hey, if you happen to be on the latest version, the 15.4.5, you're not vulnerable to this. But like all things in world, in life, let's start with an easy one. Let's go to a harder one. All right, so now we're looking at Google Chrome. Uh, didn't say it would be impossible, but uh, if, if you look to the side in the configurations, you'll notice something key is missing, which makes this kind of actually a really hard problem to solve. There's no application and operating system binding. So all of us in this room, because we're familiar with Google Chrome, uh, can tell you, yes, this can run on a Mac OS and this can run on iOS and iPad and uh, tons of other devices. Google Chrome almost runs everywhere. And so in this one, if you're on 99. whatever that is, uh, it's a version and excluding. So your version just needs to be that version or later. So, but you have to answer all of these questions. Can it be on an Apple? Well, it doesn't tell you explicitly. So you need to be able to accurately st make that statement. And does it require a script or do you, can, can you get it off of the recon? And if it is expressed in recon, how do you get it? This is where uh, some machine learning algorithms and some AI stuff that we wrote uh, helps come with this. Uh, using a bunch of open source intelligence that's available out there, dev feeds, our own user data, um, we're able to bind this to pretty accurately to what they are. So again, we have the vendor, the product, the version limits. So we have the workflow for detecting these and resolving these, which is what I'm going to go through now. So there are three main components to, to the workflow. We have the Jamf Pro, which because uh, I work at Jamf, the Jamf Pro or the Jamf technologies need to be front and center in how we resolve all these things. Uh, this engine that I've been talking about thus far, where, hey, I'm binding how these are reported out in the public to how they happen to be defined on the device or how they are reported in Jamf Pro, the binding for that happens in uh, the system that I use. And then you have your ticketing. Uh, ticketing can be a little bit more of an abstract sense. It's all of the destinations that we use to help us track if it's getting patched, how it's getting patched, how it was detected, who was it, where does it fall into our compliance standards. So like any good integration, it should be event driven. So the very first step is a device inventories, uh, the device inventories, which causes a webhook. Uh, if you've worked with our webhooks, you know that they are very minimal. There's about 12 fields that basically just say, you know, here's the device, here's who owns the device, uh, and, and a couple of metrics like serial number and UDID and uh, report dates. And so the very first, next thing we have to do is we have to go back and collect the data. So we go and collect device details from Jam Pro. Uh, in certain conditions, we might collect them from other sources as well, besides just the Jam Pro. So uh, if it's a senior leadership, we might collect uh, uh, protect logs or something like that in the same process. 
Uh, once we have the full computer record and we're holding that in memory, we go ahead and we compare it to all of our data stores that we have. So we have open source intelligence, which is just like, here's data that's available publicly to everybody. You know, that could be like developer feeds, which is on the bottom or app store. Uh, you get the NVD, CISA, we have our own protect agents, uh, all of this information. So we go through each one of these with the applications that are on it, the operating system, and any data that happens to come back from the Jam Pro about that device. We then have to make some decisions uh, related to it. And key decisions might be, this might be an application that we have never seen before in our environment. If that's the case, then we need to further interrogate it, collect uh, data about, you know, what kind of category is it? What kind of um, usage is it? Uh, where did they get it? Uh, was it from an app store? Did they get it from self-service? Did they get it from, um, did they just go to a random website and download it? We try to do our best to, to find all of that information autonomously without having to actually either directly ask the user or spend a ton of time looking for it. But once we make all those, uh, we fire, oops. Once we get all those, we fire off back to the Jam Pro. Um, so we have a set of extension attributes, which I'll be talking in a couple of slides that help us use the Jam Pro to leverage experiences or user experiences that we've already built in there. So we set the EAs, the EAs are tied to smart groups. Uh, and then we can use the smart groups and the EAs in our traditional Splunk uh, reporting fashion that's available as a TA on Splunk base and has a different JNUG talk related to it. Uh, but you can use that to get all of this information to a SIM and SOAR platform. After it's done with that, it goes ahead and messages our ticketing system. Again, I said this is abstract. So uh, we have a self-hosted database that contains some of this information. We send some of the information to Splunk. We put some of the information in ServiceNow. Uh, but really what it is, is we want to start the resolution process. And for us, the resolution process means setting up the user and IT to remediate the issue, whether IT is choosing to do this autonomously, like with app installers, or if IT and the user are brought together to like, hey, you need to remove this application within the next two weeks, or you need to update this application within two weeks, and it's not a, an application that we have app installers yet. But let's get to the EAs. So let's go to the next slide. So the very first EA that everybody will probably care about is what is the raw list of common vulnerabilities? So this is a text field. It's a comma separated. So an example would be you have CVE-2022-19,999. Uh, you can use an advanced search or a computer uh, a smart group um, below, which I have the, uh, the criteria. So if security operations comes in and says, hey, we need to check this specific CVE. This engine can be checked really fastly by just, well, use the like command. Like command in a group search like this is basically just a regex saying, is this string contained within the value of the, of the extension attribute? And of course, you want to do the, is the device managed, and then put a last inventory update, and you have some kind of reasonable amount of time. You don't want to be looking at devices that have an inventory in 90 days or 200 days or something like that. So put those cute little filters on the bottom. And this is just a really slick way because once you do this, let's say your security admin is a Splunk admin, uh, they can literally just say, if it's an advanced search and you say, hey, you want this on the regular, just go ahead, call the advanced search. They'll get the list of computers. Um, if, it's an, if it's a smart group, you can still get it via the API, but you can use that as a, as a criteria section or reporting within your Splunk within your Jam Pro dashboards. So you can find your number of computers or you can attach those computers to a resolution or you can take away rights or something like that. The next one is your traditional counts. Um, uh, security operations typically wanna know just how many vulnerabilities are across their organization and they wanna be able to measure how that gets changed by what they do. So for instance, you might wanna count your critical, count your high and count your normal create a little baseline and then deploy an app installer and watch uh, how does that change the security posture of organization having an automatic updating mechanism for your applications. So uh, this just is a raw integer. So, but you might want to use these for like access rights or something like that. So, hey, I don't, if they have a, if they have five criticals on their device, I don't want them to have a company critical application or I just kind of want to generally report on them. This is a pretty clean and cute way to do it. The next one is actually one that's a little bit uh, important to us, which is uh, CVE has passed due and passed due CISA. So when we have our business 
a specific detection or a specific CVE must be resolved by a certain date. What we can do is write as a Boolean statement, which there isn't Boolean statements, it's just a text field. I just use true false to represent it. But you use the, the Boolean statement to say they are in compliance or not to one of these two standards. The past due is our internal business standards. And then the past due CISA is the government standard for vulnerabilities where they say this one must be resolved by this date. So if we, if it says it must be resolved by July 1st and it's July 20th and we're inventorying, it come, it'll come back and say the government already said that this should be resolved. So kicks it kicks it into a little bit higher gear. This lets a put us up. You can adjust like the priority of a ticket to say, hey, IT, you're going to get all criticals as a ticket. Um, but if you get all the critical, if the CVE is a critical and it's past due, that ticket's going to have a critical priority that, you know, you must resolve it in a much faster cadence instead of the traditional cadence. So what does the user experience generally look like? Well, the fact that we write this as EAs means you can define the user experience however you want. So uh, we can nudge the user for updates. Uh, we can send a Slack message. And you can have the, the cute little buttons or the really easy to use buttons where you can say, you know, open a ticket. And that can directly pair you know, IT and the user to figure out what's going on. Like, for instance, in this case, we're saying my MacBook um, and PyCharm are out of date. It has a critical vulnerability that must be updated. Uh, I have eight days left to remove it or update it. You know, I can open up a ServiceNow ticket and say, I don't know how you're getting this. That's not my MacBook. Or I can say, delete the application, which will, you know, interact with the Jam Pro and then go ahead and remove it from the applicant, from that device. Just really easy for the user to work with. Um, we also have Nudge for operating system updates. But really the crutch of this is it allows us to have our internal users have the ability to install the applications that they work with best but allow us to maintain our standards around that. So we can go ahead and say, you know, hey, there's applications that have newer versions. Uh, they're not tracked by Kenobi or our app installers, but you know, please go ahead and update wherever you got this application. Please get up to the latest version or please remove it because, hey, you're not using it or some reason like that. All right, but next I'm gonna show you a little bit of an example. So this was our internal one. Um, let's play guess the date. Uh, we decided that we wanted to track what our vulnerability posture was when we turned on the Firefox app installers. And judging by the graph, it becomes pretty obvious where we turned it on. It was about that, you know, that Mar March 14th time window we went ahead and said update. And then, as you can see, it took about three days, four days, and all of a sudden we were detecting effectively zero vulnerabilities compared to the, the 20,000 that we were having prior. One of the key issues related to applications updating is that while well, Mozilla Firefox and Google Chrome and Office 365 and Adobe, they all have really great built-in self-updaters, but they have a critical, a critical flaw or a critical crutch in that they need some service running. So uh, your Firefox without being distributed from the App Store or distributed from app installers with an app installer policy that uh, allows it to stay up to date, Unless you are actively using the application, it will not update. And you still get detected vulnerabilities as far as the government is concerned and CISA is concerned and as far as auditors are concerned by having that on the device. So app installers plus this gives you a really great way to go ahead and verify that you're patching, that you're reducing your security um, footprint, that you're reducing your risk footprint, and you can report this back. And with that, Thanks for listening. Again, my name's Kyle Pazenak. I work for work for Jamf in the information security. If you like what you see here, uh, reach out to your customer's success, and we can look at ways to, to talk about the story that you are trying to film.